Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you all. I hope oh, it's a glorious day, isn't it? Beautiful. What a beautiful day. Uh, we should all really be meeting outside, having a church outside. That would be lovely, wouldn't it? If only it was so simple, but that would be good. Um, just a couple of, well, I don't know what your week has been like, uh, whether it's been good or bad. Um, I don't know how you feel about the things that you see on the TV or on the, on the internet, the, the, uh, the things that are happening in the news. Uh, lots of good things, lots of difficult things. Um, what, I don't know if you have, well, I've got a, my favourite book in the Bible, I'm not sure if you're allowed to a favourite book in the Bible, but I think my favourite book in the Bible is 1 Peter. And 1 Peter is a great book because it addresses our, our life um, as it really is. It doesn't kind of pull any punches. It says that life is difficult sometimes. Uh, in fact, that we can expect it to be difficult. Um, and Peter certainly experienced that. All the disciples experienced that difficulty. But uh, in the midst of that, he speaks of hope. And I want to read to you just a few verses from the beginning of 1 Peter, uh, or sorry, from 1 Peter chapter 3, and uh, starting in verse 15. And this passage, I think, can really, if you like, summarise what's happening with the rest uh, of, of the book, well, the rest of today's service, uh, and we'll really, I hope, pick up uh, what's the main point of our service today. So let's, this is from 1 Peter 3, verse 15. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give you the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behaviour in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the, right, the unrighteous, to bring you to God. We uh, have been brought to God because of what Christ has done. His death uh, once for all people to make it possible for each one of us to come to him. It doesn't mean that our life is going to be rosy all the time. In fact, we can expect difficulties. But in the midst of that, Paul, uh, Peter says, in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. And that's really the message for today, uh, to set apart Christ as Lord in your life in the light of the difficulties in our world. Uh, as, we, as we'll see, we pick up Matthew chapter 24. But let me pray, and then we'll uh, sing our first song, which picks up that idea of Christ's death once for all for us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together as your people again this morning. We pray for those who are away. Uh, we pray for those who are on the, on the way here. We ask, Lord, that you be with each one of us. Help us to focus our hearts and our minds on you. And we pray, Father, that, that this day you would fill us with joy and thankfulness but also with a sense of determination to serve you and honour you in all that we do. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So will you please stand with me as we sing? Well, actually, oh, as we sing. Um, I would love to be able to say, let's stand and sing. I'd love to be able to say that. We're going to sing. Um, but uh, if you ever want to sing, you can join our band and um, that would be great. So then you can actually, if you really can't hold it in, if you really can't hold it in, come and join us. So, uh, but, but please, please stand with us as a symbol of your unity with us. You can hum along, you can speak the words, you just can't sing them. So uh, let's have our first song.
as we remain standing, um, you might like to just give thanks or praise to God for his name, for his goodness, for his glory, for all that he has done. You might like to do that in the quiet of your heart, or you might like to say it out loud if you'd like to say a prayer of thanks and praise to God uh, where you're standing. It doesn't have to be long, uh, but let's just give thanks and praise to God. Dear Heavenly Father, we've all come here with different backgrounds and different uh, experiences during this week, but we all come together to experience you, uh, to hear you speak to us. Lord, we praise you uh, that we can do that because of Jesus, because he gave himself once for all. We praise you for that death. Um, Lord, as we come up to Easter, we pray, Father, that it won't be just us who are celebrating you. We thank you that Christians across the world, of course, will be celebrating the, the death and resurrection of Christ. But we pray, Lord, that the name of, of Jesus would not just be uh, praised by, by those who are part of a church, but, Lord, we pray that you might bring new people in um, to hear your name and to, and to proclaim your glory because you are worthy of it. And so, Father, we thank you that we can meet together again today uh, through, through Christ. And we thank you that by your spirit you are with us. We ask that you would speak to us, encourage us and strengthen us uh, in all we do this, this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. As we remain standing, I know you want to sit down, but too bad. Um, let's encourage each other with this affirmation of faith, the responsive creed. Um, I'm the little type, you're the big type. So let's go for it. Uh, we believe in one God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is the true and living God, worthy to receive glory and honour and power. He created all things. By his will, they existed and were created. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. All things came into being through him. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him, all things in heaven and on earth were created. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Being in the form of God, he emptied himself. He took the form of a slave and was born in human likeness. Being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. God also highly exalted Jesus. He gave him the name that is above every name. God has put all things under his feet. He made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. Through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. As all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. What a great God. What a great saviour. God is now going to speak to us as we open his word. I'm going to invite Michelle and Margaret up to come and read from Matthew 24. The first reading is Matthew 24. And I'm reading from verse 1 to 25. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumours of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, for the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. 
Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. The second reading is from Matthew 24, beginning at verse 36, through to the end of that chapter. The day and hour unknown. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That's how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at, the t at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have left, let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Then is the faithful and wise servant, whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household, to give them their food at the proper time. It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will be put in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time, and he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Here ends the reading. I wonder if you've ever wondered about the end of the world. Uh, what's going to happen, what's it going to be like, all that kind of stuff. Uh, well, today I can say without any fear of contradiction that you're going to know everything you need to know about the end of the world. <laughs> Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you um, for the promises in your word um, and we pray that you would help us to understand them this morning. Um, Lord, help me to speak truly and clearly and we pray, Father, that when we come away from here today, we'll we come away here encouraged, uh, that challenged uh, and changed to be the people you want us to be. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I wonder what you would do if I said to you that you only have a day to live or maybe a week to live or maybe a month. What would you do? Would that change anything about your life? Uh, my guess is it probably would. Particularly, it would be different if, if uh, you were, I told you that you had like 50 years to live. Some of you go, oh my goodness, not another 50. Uh, <laughs> what would change if you knew you only had a short amount of time to live? 
Um, you know, there's lots of people who have got a bucket list of things they'd like to do or thing, people they'd like to say, things they'd like to say to different people, that kind of thing. Um, what would you do? Well, we'll come back to that idea a little bit later, what should change for us. But today's passage, uh, Matthew 24, if you've got a Bible there or a, a phone with the Bible on it, you might like to have that open. No Facebooking, please. That would be good. Um, today's passage comes at a very critical point in Jesus, his, in Jesus' ministry. We've seen the last couple of chapters. We start in chapter 21. We're following Jesus towards the cross. And we saw Jesus come into Jerusalem and go to the temple where he's been in conflict with the religious leaders. Um, he's been getting their goat and they've been trying to pull him down without success. Um, and now he's leaving Jerusalem. The next time he comes to, into Jerusalem, he will be arrested and killed. And so basically this passage forms a kind of bridge, if you like, from where he, he, he's, what he's just experienced, the opposition of the religious leaders, to his, the, the consequence of that, that conflict, his death. Um, it's one of those passages that uh, is, a lot of people find very confusing. It's got some very unfamiliar images and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you, know, you, you always know you're in trouble in the Bible when it says, let the reader understand, because you kind of go, oh, I don't understand. Um, but I, th I think as we go, to it, go through this passage, you're going, to find, you're going to see that actually this passage's message is very, very simple. It's really very simple. But let's get there. Remember Jesus leaving the temple. He's just been fighting with the religious leaders. And you can imagine he's probably a bit stressed. Um, you know, when you've, you've been in conflict with someone, often your kind of adrenaline's kind of going. You, you've, you heard they said this and I said this and all that kind of thing. And Jesus is leaving the temple. And you can almost see the disciples looking at Jesus thinking, oh, he's pretty stressed. It's been difficult for him. Let's try and cheer him up. And so in verse 1, we see as Jesus left the temple, it's walking away. His disciples come up to him and call his attention to the buildings. It's almost like they're saying, look, Jesus, I know you've had a difficult time with the religious leaders, but at least the building looks good. Look at, look at, the, look at the, the, the moldings. They're so beautiful. And the, 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 the trimmings are just so delightful. And, and the size of the stones and the carvings in the, in the rock and all that kind of stuff. It's beautiful stuff. They're really trying to encourage Jesus, I think. But not for the first time, nor the last time, Jesus' response is not what they expected. Jesus turns to them and he says, Do you see all these things? All this beautiful stuff that you've been pointing out? Truly I tell to you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. In other words, this temple that you think is so beautiful is going to become a pile of rubble. What a great way to bring the mood down, Jesus. Thank you very much for that. Um, you can see the disciples. You can always see them going, oh, we we're trying to make you feel better and you know, you're cranky at us. Crank at them there and crank at us and so, throw, taking it out of the temple. And, and so as they walk off, you can imagine them going, and later on, they get, they get the opportunity um, to speak to Jesus. They've got a bit of time with him privately. They say, look, Jesus, could you explain what you just said then? And say, tell us, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of the coming of the end of the age? They've got their picture from the Old Testament of God coming and establishing his kingdom and you know, lions lying down with lambs, that kind of thing. Um, the kingdom of God, peace, prosperity. Um, the king from David's line sitting on the throne. And perhaps they say, what's the sign of your, co of your coming? They recognise that Jesus is the person who's going to establish this. And maybe they're kind of going, maybe the sign, one of the signs is going to be you know, you, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey. We saw that last week. Maybe that's the sign. Maybe we've seen the signs. Is this the time, Jesus? Maybe that's what they're thinking. They're hoping that this is the time that, that Jesus is going to work all this out. Um, they've, got these, they've got these questions, but Jesus, and they, they're natural questions, aren't they? Jesus, when's it going to happen? And show us, how do we know it's going to happen? And so Jesus, in response talks about two different events and so this chapter what he does he kind of interweaves these two events together uh, in a way that uh, it's almost like he's looking at the two from from a distance it's almost like if you had gone to if he'd driven to the blue mountains along the m4 um, out of sydney um, or maybe if you're going south towards um, going up the mountains towards canberra um, when you look at the mountains as you're driving up the, the road you can see mountains can't you right and, and you say, well, there's the blue mountains. There's blue and there's, there's a lump bit there and there's flat and there's a lump, lump bit. And you say, well, there's the mountains.
and you could describe the mountains. Um, but when you actually, what you're actually describing is not just one line of mountains, is it? It's actually a whole layers of mountains. And so you can, you can describe, them, try to describe them all as one kind of thing, or you can describe them a bit, bit at a time. These two things that Jesus is going to describe are actually part of the same reality, but they're two different events. The first event is the one he refers to when he says that all these rocks, well, all these things that you see here, won't be, they won't have one stone on another. But to understand that, we actually need to go back to something that's happened in the past, um, back a couple of hundred years, well, about five or 600 years. Many of you will remember from the Old Testament that Israel was taken off into exile. Do you remember that? Yeah. Who were they taken off by? Do you remember? The Babylonians, very good. Um, the Babylonians took them off into exile. And for a while, the Babylonians, they were the world's superpower at the time, but uh, they didn't last all that long because uh, pretty soon they were overtaken by um, the, the Persians who came in. Uh, and you may remember the story in Daniel, meaning, meaning, tickle the parson, you know that one? Um, <clears throat> that's, where, that's where it changed over from the Babylonians to the Persians. And so for, for another 200 years, the Israelites... Well, actually, for a while they, they were under the Persians, but then one of the Persian kings said, well, you guys, rather than having you here in exile, you're allowed to go home. And so he sent them home in about 540 BC. They kind of trickled back to, to Israel, back, and they started to build, rebuild Jerusalem. But even though they did that, they were still under the thumb of the Persians. And so they had to pay taxes and all that kind of stuff. Um, that, happened for, that stayed that way for a couple of hundred years until about 334 BC when someone else came along, um, a pretty, pretty powerful guy by the name of Alexander the Great. Has anyone ever heard of him? Um, Alexander the Great started from Greece and he kind of swept through um, the known world and he came through, um, through Israel and booted out the, the Persians. So, so now the Greeks were in charge. And so instead of having Israel as a standalone nation, they were, instead of, they were just like being passed, from, it's like a hot potato, they said, no, you have them, you have them, like this. And so the, you know, the Greeks had them. And for a number, for a number of years, that was fine. Um, they, you know, it's, they're living under a superpower, but they, it was okay because they, they allowed the, the, uh, the Jewish people to continue their, um, their religion as, as they wanted to do. They didn't, they didn't um, persecute them or anything like that until a guy by the name of King Antiochus Epiphanes IV, Comes along. I know you're hoping your grandchildren will be called that, King Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Um, he ruled in Palestine from about 175 BC to about 64 BC, just before um, that they, they actually got kicked out themselves. But while he was while he was in charge, he treated the, the Israelites very badly, with real with with great violence and contempt. Um, so much so that they actually rose up against him. And they managed to, um, to, to, to kick him out or kick the Greeks out of Jerusalem. But taking on a superpower can be a bit um, dangerous, as they found out, because Antiochus decided, this, well, I'm not going to be kicked out by these people. He comes in to suppress the rebellion. And when he does that, he comes into Jerusalem, killing people left, right and centre, and goes into the temple. Um, he stops the sacrifices, the daily sacrifices that are happening there, and he actually builds in the centre of the temple, in the Holy of Holies, an altar to Zeus. And on that altar, he sacrifices pigs. You can imagine how well that went down. Not very well at all. There's something actually that the prophet Daniel spoke about. In your, in your own time during the, day, during the week, you might like to look up Daniel chapter 9 to 11. Don't look at it now. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of a strange passage. It's a, a vision that Daniel has. And Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, speaks to him about, as part of that vision, he speaks about a prince who's going to come into Jerusalem and destroy the, uh, the city, the temple, and its sacrifices. And it says he will set up um, an abomina abomination that causes desolation. And then later in chapter 11, the same thing. It says forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and abolish the daily sacrifice. <clears throat> they will set up. The abomination that causes desolation. Uh, the passage, that, uh, a phrase that um, Matthew picks up here. That abomination, of course, as, uh, as the Jews look back, they realise that this is the fulfilment of the promise when Antiochus comes in and he builds this temple to Zeus. Uh, it's an abomination to offer 
um, a sacrifice to another god in the temple. What could be worse than that? It's brought desolation, in fact, to the the worship of God's of, of the true worship of God, um, because the, he stopped all the, all the sacrifices. And so it was called the abomination that causes desolation. Now Jesus, as he talks about what he's talking about, it says in verse fifteen, "You will know." So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea, Judea flee to the mountains. You see, Jesus says, he wants, I want you to look back and to remember this horrible event that happens, this terrible thing that happened. Well, let me, let, let me tell you that it's going to happen again. And this time it's going to be even worse. I mean, what could be worse? Then going in, there's somebody coming in and desecrating the temple. Well, uh, not too long after Jesus died and went to be with his father, um, well, the Romans were there. The, the Romans came in about 63 BC, and mostly, a bit like at the beginning of the Greek uh, um, uh, rule, the Jews were allowed to worship God. They were declared to be a legal religion under Julius Caesar, um, and they were able to keep on their sacrifices and all that kind of stuff. Um, but just like with the Greeks before them, um, the tensions between the Jews and the Romans rose uh, because they got a bit sick of sending off um, taxes to, uh, to the emperor and that kind of thing. So much so that in AD 66, they rose up and what they had what's called the, the first Jewish rebellion in AD 66. Uh, the Jews were indeed revolting. And that's what the Romans thought. They, they were revolting. So they decided... You can't let this little nation kind of rise up against the, who they think they are, rising up against the Roman Empire. And so they came in. They came to Jerusalem. Um, General Titus in AD 70 stormed Jerusalem, capturing it, destroying the city and destroying the temple. And to this day, the temple does not stand. The only part of the temple that's left is the kind of the western wall, the, 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 weep, the weeping wall, the wailing wall, um, which is kind of part of the foundation of the temple. There's now a whacking big mosque on top of it. Um, and so from that day, the temple has not, has not been. And the descriptions of the fall of Jerusalem were horrible. See, rather than besieging the city and just um, overwhelming it with force, the Romans decided to kind of starve them out for a bit first. And so they surrounded the city. Um, and you might, some of you have heard of a historian named Josephus. Um, he describes what it was like, the storming of, uh, or the capture of Jerusalem. And he describes um, bodies lying where they fell in the streets. Uh, it describes people eating the leather on their, um, their sandals because there was nothing else to eat, and even a woman who killed and ate her own child. Um, horrible, horrible things. Only those who fled were, who were spared. You see, Jesus wants his disciples to know that the judgment that he's been speaking about that's, that's going to fall on the religious leaders, we heard about that last week, is not just going to fall on them, but on the whole system. The whole system is going to come crashing down because there's going to be a huge change here. No longer are people going to come to the temple to, to, to offer their sacrifices and to, get the, to receive forgiveness and to connect with God. They have to come to Jesus. And the judgment is falling on the whole of Jerusalem. And the whole sacrificial system and all of that is going to come crashing down, never to be rebuilt. And it's going to be the Romans, these people who carried around that abomination, the, the idolatrous image of the emperor, who are going to come in and they're going to destroy the city and they're going to set up their image of the emperor where it shouldn't be, in the very temple mount. And that's exactly what happened in AD 70. And so Jesus is saying to his disciples, be careful, pay attention. When you see these things happening, run away. Luke, in his description on this um, passage, actually says, when you see the soldiers surrounding Jerusalem, then flee to the mountains. And it turns out that that's what the Christians did. Um, again, Josephus mentions that uh, when the, the Romans came, the Christians fled. They went to a city called Pella, just outside Jerusalem. Uh, so Jesus is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem here, but that's not all he's talking about, because that's not all he was asked about. The uh, disciples said, what's going to be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus was to answer that question as well. 
And the clue, he says, is in verse 32, which we actually didn't read, so let me read it to you. Verse 32. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. He says, in other words, you know when you look around you what's coming. You can see the signs. So if it was uh, in Sydney, we don't have them down here so much, but in Sydney, so if, if you, when, when you see the jacarandas come out, when you see everything go purple, you'll know that summer is near. You know the exams are on because they're always on, the HSC is on while well, the jacarandas are out, uh, but, uh, but summer is coming. He's saying when you, when you look at the fig tree and you see the new growth there, you see the leaves starting to come out, you know that it's about to be summertime. And so he says, you know, you'll know that the, the Son of Man is coming. You'll know the end is near when you see these signs, which sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? Because we're going to know, we're going to get the answers to when Jesus is coming back. That's awesome, isn't it? Fantastic. So let's get there. And Jesus talks about signs, but the signs are not going to be much fun. Now, uh, I, I haven't ever been in labour, um, but I'm told it's not much fun. I'm t- told it's quite difficult. Is that right? Yeah, a little bit difficult at times. Um, well, Jesus says these signs are going to be a little bit like labour pains. He says in verse 8, all these are the beginning of birth pains. These signs that we're going to see are going to be difficult. So what are they? Well, in verse 4, he tells, tells us one of the signs. Many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. There will be false prophets coming. Uh, he, got, he says it again uh, a little bit later on um, down in verse 23. There are many who say, look, here's the Messiah. False messiahs, false prophets will appear, perform great signs and wonders, uh, if possible, to deceive even the elect. False messiahs, false kings, false lords are going to rise up. That's one sign. Another sign is that the world is going to become a very messy place. In verse 6, you'll hear of wars and rumours of wars. Nation will rise against nation in verse 7. Kingdom against kingdom. There are going to be battles. There are going to be, uh, there are going to be wars and insurrections, those kind of things. But if that's not enough, there are also going to be famines and earthquakes in all sorts of places. The world's going to shake. But it's not just going to be big and and difficult for the world out there. It's going to be difficult particularly for Christians. And so in verse 9, we read, Then you you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. Christians are going to be persecuted. They're going to be executed. They're going to be killed for their faith. Because they follow Jesus, they're going to be hated. And that's not all, because... Wickedness is going to increase in verse 12. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. The love of the world will be not for God, but for their own pleasure. And so they will turn their back on God. They will go grow cold to him. And the final sign is the abomination that causes desolation. You'll see it and you know it's coming. So there's, some, there's signs that Jesus points out. So what do we do now? Well, we have to be careful here because there's a temptation for us, and people, Christians have done it throughout the ages, to go, hmm, here's a sign. Talks about wars and rumours of wars. I remember a war, you know, the Great War, the war to end all wars. That surely is a sign. That's a, that's, that's a, that's a huge war. Or they, they, they see earthquakes and they see ozone layers being depleted and they see all those kind of things. They think, well, it must be the time of the end. Wickedness is growing. We see the evil in the streets. The signs are there. But when you think about it, actually, the signs have always been there. Right from the very beginning, there have been false prophets rising up and deceiving people. False messiahs, trying to pe- people trying to get people to follow them. Starting from people like Arius in the, the second century, who said Jesus was not the son of God. Um, right through to uh, the, the prof- false prophets like your Jim Joneses and um, David Koresh's of the world, but also um, the prosperity gospel preachers and the liberal theologians of our, of our own age. There have always been people who have tried to lead the, the, the people of God away, haven't there? But not only that... There have always been wars and rumours of wars. Yes, the 20th century was maybe the bloodiest century that there has been, but you wouldn't exactly call it the, like, there isn't a mortgage on war, does it? Right from, from Jesus' time there have been wars. It's through the, you know, there's, there's the Crusades and all those kinds of things. Uh, wars have been going on for centuries. 
And we think about earthquakes and we, we see um, tsunamis happening out um, just off the shore of New Zealand last week. Uh, we see earthquakes coming and we, we hear about global warming and you know, things are changing and ice caps melting. And we think, well, oh, goodness, everything's going terribly. But again, this, this is nothing new. There have been earthquakes, there have been natural disasters for all time. They've, for, ever since Jesus has been around, there have been, uh, there have been people dying through bloodshed because of humans, but also because of, of nature, natural disasters. And we, we, might also th- we might look at our world and we go, well, life is getting harder for Christians, isn't it? We look at what's been happening in, uh, in Victoria recently about changing the laws and making it illegal for Christians to, to say or to do particular things. And we think, well, it's getting worse, isn't it? But actually, it's only because we, we've, we've been living in this um, West bubble where we've been kind of insulated from persecution because actually Christians have been persecuted throughout the ages. In fact, we are the unusual ones to have been in such a blessed time where we haven't been persecuted. Right from the time when Nero used to use Christians as human torches for his garden parties all the way through to you know, the, the, those Christians who were beheaded in Egypt a couple of years ago, a year or so ago back, um, North Koreans who are, who are Christians who are taken off into concentration camps even as we speak. Terrible things are going on and have always been going on. Christians have always been hated for their faith. And then we look at our world, we see the immorality, we might shake our heads at uh, the uh, things like... Uh, that we see in the last couple of days about the way people behave that, um, in, our, in our governments or in our schools or um, as they march through the streets or whatever. We, we, we shake our heads at the immorality in our world. We think how terrible it is. But again, you don't have to look very far back to see things just as bad, if not worse. Um, you know, it's, it's not like it was in the 50s when everybody was all prim and proper and everything, but, but surely as you look back, we think, think about the terrible things um, that people have done over the years. Lawlessness and immorali- immorality are not new. All of these things have been happening. And of course, as we saw, the, the abomination that caused desolation has already happened. So what on earth do we do with this? I said at the beginning that you can know everything that you need to know about the end of the world... And I've given you nothing. No help at all. Jesus has been giving signs, but they're signs that have been going on for centuries. But that's exactly the point. You see, in verse 36, Jesus says, About the day or the hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. In other words, you can do all the investigations and calculations you like. You're never going to work it out. It doesn't matter how, how clever you think you are or how you try to interpret the signs. You will never know when Christ is going to return. He says right up until the day that Jesus returns, life will be going on as normal. People will be getting married. People will be going to work. People will be um, playing football and um, going to the opera and not singing in church. People will be doing all of these things. And Jesus could return at any moment. The signs are there. And we need to heed the signs to realise that Jesus is coming back and the world will end and it could be tomorrow. I said to you um, earlier, or I asked you earlier, what you would do if you were told, what would change in your life if you were told you only had a day to live or a week to live or a month to live? Well, yes, that would be a hard kind of diagnosis to receive. But in some ways, um, nothing should change, should it? Because it's quite like it's quite possible that the world could end tomorrow, that Jesus could return. Or it could be next week, or it could be next month, or it could be 50 years. It doesn't matter. In the end, Jesus says, whatever you do, be ready. So in verse 44, the take-home message really in this passage is so simple. Be ready. Verse, verse 42, he says, therefore keep watch. Because you don't know what day your Lord will come. And verse 34, you must also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So what do you need to know about the end of the world? It's coming. You don't know when. It could be tomorrow. It could be today. Or it could be a thousand years' time. It doesn't really matter because the end result for us is to be the same. 
We need to be ready. And how do we be ready? Well, in verse 46, he says it will be good for... Well, let me read from verse 45. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants of his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. In other words, when Jesus comes back, may he find us doing his will. He has given us a job to do, to live a life that honours and glorifies him. Every moment of every day lived as if he could be coming back right now. Wouldn't it be a tragedy for Christ to return and for us to be going, oh, I meant to get to that. I was, if you come back on Sunday, Jesus, I would have been ready. I would have been here because I, I would be at church. That's, I was being really holy then. But during the week, well, I don't quite get around to it, Jesus. So maybe if you don't mind, go, just come back. Um, what a tragedy it would be to live and, and for him to return and for us not to be ready. Life in this world is difficult. And when we see the pain and the suffering on the news each night, we should, we should actually take the heat. We should realise that the signs are there. It's like labour pains. Labour pains are there not just to make women's lives difficult, but to let them know that a baby is coming. They need to be ready. And so it is with us. These difficulties are here to show us, to get our attention Say, don't forget, this world is going to end. So be ready. Now, it hasn't been very cheery, has it, really, this passage? But I do want to end with, some, with two positive things to say. Um, and they come out of this passage. The first one is to not despair. In verse 14, in the midst of all this stuff, in the midst of all the, you know, the wars and the earthquakes and the, the persecution and executions of Christians and all that kind of stuff, in verse 14, Jesus says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. In other words, in the midst of all this carnage, God is still at work. It's not as if God's been thwarted by persecution. He doesn't care what Daniel Andrews says. God is going to, going to do his will and the kingdom will continue to be pronounced. People will continue to grow. God will be at work. And which is actually a really important thing for us to remember when we think about our strategy meetings on today, that in the end, it's God who is at work. All of our plans are at his command. And we need to submit everything we have to him. And with great joy, because we know that he will see it done. God has a plan and it will not be thwarted. So don't despair. When you see the difficult things in life, know that God is still here and God is still at work. And the second thing is to remember, just like with labour pains, labour pains say that the birth is coming and generally speaking, it's a time of great joy. The labour pains that we see around us remind us that there will be great joy. It will be great for the servant um, who, whose master finds him doing what he left him to do. Why? In verse 47, truly I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. He will bless him with all of everything that he has. When Christ returns and he finds us doing his will, he will welcome us into his home. We'll enjoy that eternal banquet that is being prepared for us. What an amazing privilege that is. What an amazing joy it is to know that despite the pain and the suffering in our world, Christ will return and bring us home. His blessings will be poured out on all who believe, on all of us. How brilliant is that? It's really fantastic, isn't it? So when you look at the, all the pain in our world, do a couple of things. Firstly, recognise the signs. They tell us that Jesus is coming back. This world is living on borrowed time. One day, soon, it will end and we need to be ready. So be ready. Be found doing God's work. Every moment of every day, live for him. Give him the honour and glory that he deserves. And as you do that, look forward with great hope and joy, knowing that he will take you home to be with him. Let me pray. Dear Lord God, we praise you for the way your word speaks so clearly into our hearts and into our world. 
Um, Lord, you know us better than we know ourselves and you know our world better than we know it. Lord, we pray that you would help us to read the signs that are around us. Our world is ending and you are returning. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to be ready. I pray that each person in this room, people watching it uh, online, Father, we pray that each one of us would submit our, our life to you, live with you as our Lord, as well as our Saviour, to give you honour and glory. And Father, we look forward to the day when Jesus will return. In fact, we pray with John in the book of Revelation and we say, come Lord Jesus. Amen.
please uh, join with me in prayer. Father God, we praise you. You are Lord of the universe. Thank you for sending Jesus into our world to show us what you are like and to teach us, but most especially to save us from our sin. Thank you that now we can look forward with hope to life forever with you in a new world when Jesus returns in glory. We are glad that your word says that those who stand firm to the end will be saved. We hang on to that wonderful promise and also that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. As we think of this, Lord, we pray that you will encourage and strengthen all those who have left their homes and comfort zones to share the gospel. We especially remember Simon and Jess Cowell with CMS in Bari, Italy, as they work within COVID restrictions and begin weekly Bible studies with uni students. We pray for Jess reading the Bible with women and Simon as he trains the students even during exam time. Thanks, Lord, that they are now able to meet with church families, one, one family at a time. We give thanks that Andrew and Liz Glover are able to have this time in Australia to spend with their family and friends. And we pray for their church, ICF Phnom Penh, in their absence. We ask, Lord, for the provision of somewhere to meet, that the meeting restrictions will be lifted, that finances would improve, and that the youth worker will be able to return from Ireland. Close our ears, Lord, against false prophets who tickle our ears with promises of health and wealth, telling us what we want to hear instead of the truth of your words. There is a hell. You do love us, but you are also perfect and must punish sin. So, Lord, thank you that in Jesus we know we do not have to face hell, separation from you, the source of love and all that is good. Help us in turn, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, to selflessly love you and each other and serve each other, so that we are among those who, by your grace, stand firm to the end and are saved. When you come in glory, you will claim us as your own. Lord, we look forward to your return, to when the things of this earth will pass away, and you will bring in your new creation. But in the meantime, Lord, please help us to live as your faithful and wise servants, taking care of your people and doing your work here on earth. Help us to grow spiritually and to share our faith so that our church will be a welcoming, caring community. We pray for the strategy meeting this afternoon asking that we will be united in vision and purpose as your people in this place. Please show each of us, Lord, how we can contribute physically, financially and personally using the gifts and abilities and resources you have given us through your spirit to encourage one another and share your love. Lord, as we wait for your return, we are very aware of the problems in our fallen world. We ask you to bring peace in the place of unrest in Myanmar and other nations at war. We ask for equ the equitable rollout of the COVID vaccine so that poorer nations have access to it as well as the rich. We pray that COVID is brought under control and ask for your comfort and care for all who are grieving and ill, both with COVID and other sicknesses. Remembering, remembering especially those who we know and love in our own community. We give thanks for the World Day of Prayer, that people from all the churches could join as one in prayer for our world. We praise you that your word does not return to you void, but achieves the purposes you have for it. It is living, active and powerful. Please equip all who preach it, wherever they are, for our own staff team here, Steve and John, for our bishops and archbishop, for our 
all pastors and teachers everywhere, for our Sunday school leaders and teachers. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we have the freedom to meet and learn about you. But Lord, we recognise that Christians are being persecuted, jailed, tortured and killed for their belief in you. Please sustain them and strengthen their faith and reliance on you and encourage their hope. Today especially we pray for the persecuted Christians in Iraq that they will be blessed by how God, God uses the current visit of the Pope to Iraq. Lord, your words will never pass away. You will return in great glory. Help us to be ready. Come, Lord Jesus. Please join with me in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, can I say thank you for coming this morning. Um, it's really been encouraging to have you all here. And for those of you who are watching online, it's great to have you as well. And we hope that maybe one day you might be able to come and join us uh, in the flesh. That would be really great. Um, a couple of quick announcements as we uh, come to the end of our service. First one is that morning tea is on straight after the service, um, but it will be outside. So um, according to COVID regulations, uh, we need to remain seated as we, ha as we stand and, or as we stand. <laughs> Let's remain seated as we sit, perhaps, uh, and have morning tea, but as we talk. Uh, so we're not allowed to kind of mill around. That's one of the things that they seem to be cranky about. So um, if, you could, if you'd like to take your seat or if you've got your own seat, um, take a seat out. Let's sit in the shade. Just be careful of the sun because it is very sun hot outside. Um, take your seat out. Morning tea will be served outside um, and uh, it'll be, you'll go to the table and get your cup of tea or coffee um, if, you, if you like coffee, um, or, and, and some cake or a biscuit. Um, just take that and then go and have a seat and, and catch up and chat. That would be really great. Um, other things that are happening up this afternoon at 2 o'clock here in the hall, uh, we'll be having our parish strategy meeting. Uh, we'll be picking up some of the ideas that uh, the, the staff and the parish council have been talking about about our church. Um, you've been sent, I believe, uh, well, you have been sent um, by email a, a copy of the parish strategy document. Um, if you haven't seen that, there are a couple of copies at the back, I believe, um, that you can go through. If you've got a, a quick half an hour or an hour, you can read through it. Only, tw only 20 pages, that's all. Um, but no, it should, it should be really exciting. So I hope you're able to come and join us. We'll go from 2 till 3.30, um, and we'll be aiming to finish right on 3.30 if we can. Um, next week also is our, our annual general meeting, our vestry meeting, for those of you who love that title. Um, that's the, the, the day when we talk about and we hear about our parish finances uh, and we also um, elect people to go into, uh, into different positions around the church. A lot of the things that we'll be talking about this afternoon will take the place of we won't, be happening. we won't be doubling up with the AGM. So it should be a nice short meeting next week, which will be really exciting. It'll be straight after this service. So we'll grab a cuppa and then sit down in here because that's what you do. Uh, and we'll have our meeting as soon as we can. But we need to get nominations in as soon as possible, um, preferably by Tuesday this week. So if you could get those in to me, that would be great. Um, if you haven't got a nomination form, please let me know and I'll give you one. Um, also, a strange thing happened during COVID. During COVID, uh, we couldn't meet for a, for a while. And so what we did, we couldn't therefore have offertories. And so uh, what we did was, well, we, ha we couldn't have the offertory box because people wouldn't be here. And so what a number of people did was that they moved their offertory from being given in cash to uh, direct giving, which is fantastic and really helpful, right? But a really weird thing has happened since we've come back is that actually a lot of people have gone back to giving in cash which is a little odd, um, but uh, just so I've got a request from the uh, treasurer and from the uh, money collectors and the wardens that if you're one of those people to maybe consider going back to continue with the direct giving. Um, it's helpful um, for us in terms of a church to be able to, to know the money that's coming in, but also um, for it, it eases the counting and the accountancy work that needs to be done. So if, you are, if that's you, then let the reader understand. Um, if you're a visitor, <laughs> 
if you're a visitor here this morning, um, just forget all that stuff. I'll tell you about offertories. You don't, that's nothing to do with you, so you don't have to worry. Um, we've almost come to the end of our service. We're going to sing one final song. We have one so- final song, which is a, a song. It's kind of uh, like a, a, almost a kid's song, really, in that it picks up the, the idea of uh, it's really upbeat and, and that kind of thing. But it actually picks up the idea that in our, in our world that, that Jesus is our light. He's the one that shows us the way to go, the way to live. Um, and it's in him that we have our hope and our meaning. I'm going to pray and then we're going to have our final song. Let me pray. From Jude verses 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Thanks for joining us. This has the morning tea. See you next week.